In a world almost forgotten sits the majestic Grand Library of Saul Phoebe. Full of knowledge and hope, it straddles two city nations full of tension. Six unlikely heroes are amongst their midst when a fire breaks out. Will they succeed in saving the library? This is Librarians and Dragons. Part 1. The Grand Library of Saul Phoebe. Oh, hello. I didn't see you come in there. Greetings, adventurers. My name is Adam Samter, and despite my ethereally floating Dungeon Master mug, <laughs> I am the Dungeon Master for today's adventure. Eventually, it'll be visible. Here we go. <laughs> Joining me today are several adventurers, both old and new to D&D. So we are going to be running a very interesting, fun campaign for you guys today. And I will be acting as both the narrator, the other players, as well as a rule arbiter, and also uh, explaining things as we go along. Because I can just imagine that many of you have heard of Dungeons & Dragons via Stranger Things or Reddit or the internet and might not know what all the big hubbub is about. So, And the same with some of our players. Some of these people have never played before. So you're going to get the introduction to Dungeons & Dragons while we play as I explain some of the rules while we go along. So please sit back and enjoy our campaign, which is called The Grand Library of Sor Phoebe. Okay, the comments, you guys can comment in, this, in the comments section, and I will be at times interacting with the audience, asking some questions, perhaps seeing if you guys can help guide the adventure or the adventuring party. We open our campaign in a somewhat arid region of this fantasy world that we are living in. This is the world of Tarragonia, which is rife with magic and interesting creatures of all sorts and varieties. Our adventure today takes us to a specific region of the world, the region known as Sort and Ephibi. The twin cities of Sort and Ephibi sit on either side of a grand, gigantic hill, as we see here. This hill is known as the on top of this, <laughs> and it sits right in between the two city-states. Now, audience, this will be our first interactive moment. There are two city-states, Sort and Ephibi. You let us know in the comments which, which section you would like to hear about first. And don't worry if you can't spell them. I know that they might not. Oh, M. Neko, we are running 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Sort or a Phoebe? Spelling does not count. All right, we got one vote for sort. Another for sort. Let's start there. All right, we got three votes for sort. That is, that is good enough for me. The city-state known as sort is a very well-organized, efficient city-state. And as our, our camera pans over, we see dozens upon dozens of soldiers and slaves training and making preparations, military preparations of sorts. Sort itself, as I said, is a very efficient, very perfunctory kind of city-state, and it is extremely militaristic in its viewpoints. Surrounded by an impressive and well-defended city wall, as well as tall citadels and towers from which archers and soldiers can get a good look around the area, Sort is known for its military might and its military prowess. Both of the city-states are led by twin brother emperors. The twin emperors of Sort and Ephibi <laughs> are known as Tweedledeedalist and Tweedledumdalus. And it's very easy to get the two mixed up, as you can see. They are twins, and I even forget at times which one rules which city-state. Sort is ruled by the very military-minded Tweedledumdalus, whereas Ephibi is ruled by his twin brother, Tweedledaedalus. Now, as I mentioned, Tweedledumdalus is very keen on military might and military strategy, whereas Ephibi our other city-state is much different. 
as opposed to the much more militaristic sort, Ephibi is ruled by the philosophers. The thinkers, the mathematicians, the scientists have great sway over the city-state known as Ephibi. Ruled by the other twin brother, Tweedle Daedalus, Ephibi is golden and technologically impressive. Much more active than sort, but also, in a way, pretty annoying, <laughs> as there are dozens and dozens of philosophers in wine-stained robes preaching random, somewhat nonsensical, mathematical, scientific, and other kinds of facts to any students who may or may not want to listen. In addition, while Sort may be far more military-minded, Phoebe is not without its advantages as well. While Phoebe doesn't have a massive wall surrounding it, they have far greater technology than their twin city-state Sort. Phoebe has weapons of war, the likes of which this world has never seen before, and other technological marvels that could give them an edge in certain scenarios. Now, as we look closer at this hill-like structure separating the two city-states, we wonder what that building is on top of it. Because these two city-states have often been, well, let's just say at odds with each other for reasons that no one can really quite recall, it was decided by the twin emperors that measures needed to be taken in order to ensure some degree of peace between the two very dichotomous city-states. What was decided was that the Grand Hill, which again we call the on top of this, would act as a buffer zone between the two city-states. And on top of this, on top of this hill, resides an impressive structure known as the Grand Library of Sor Phoebe. The library is a neutral zone. It is strictly forbidden to engage in any physical violence or warfare of any sort. And it is considered a safe haven for people from both city-states, as well as visitors from all around the world to come and check out the library in a safe and peaceful environment. The library itself is guarded by Sortian guards. Again, the Sortians are our more militaristic guards, and they are seen often training on the grounds as well. Surrounding the library is a large marketplace where the philosophers stand and give their spiels, and people go and shop for things, merchants sell their wares. This is the, known as the Agoraphobia. <laughs> the agoraphobia is with oh by the way you're going to be getting plenty of dad jokes throughout this campaign so if you're averse to those then you might just want to log out now the agoraphobia is a vibrant and colorful place full of all manners of individuals some of whom are going to check out the library and some of whom are just there to to engage in the talks of the day now as we gaze upon this structure, certain figures catch our eye. And I'm going to quickly scroll through the figures and then audience, I would like you to vote on who we would like to kind of zoom in on first. So first up here is a strangely dressed man in a toga and a purplish cloak. His eyes seem kind of glassy and he is holding a goblet in his hand and standing upon a soapbox. <laughs> the next individual is a beautiful woman gazing at herself with a very happy-go-lucky air about her as she hums happily, beginning to enter the library. Next, we see a very frazzled-looking woman, also in a toga, with strange bespectacled lenses upon her face. Now, eyeglasses are not very common in this time, so clearly, this is somebody with a little better access to technology. Next is a man in very official looking military regalia, much more impressive than the everyday guard surrounding the region. Last up is a strangely dressed gentleman in very exotic looking silks and garbs. 
This gentleman does not really fit in with the other members of Sort or a Phoebe, who by and large are wearing togas and similar sandals and apparel like that. This individual seems to come from faraway lands. So audience, in the comments section, please let us know which of these individuals you kind of want to focus on first. The harried looking woman with the spectacles on, the beautiful happy-go-lucky woman, the strange looking foreigner, the very impressive looking guard, or the rather crazy looking man in the toga with the glassy eyes. I'm seeing a lot of different comments. Frazzled is winning. Okay, let's go with the frazzled looking woman. So we get a peek inside of the grand library of Sor Phoebe. And inside this facility is a woman running around with a harried expression upon her face, carrying dozens of scrolls and tomes as she runs back and forth. Clearly this woman is some kind of library administrator, perhaps. <laughs> Seems to have a very busy day in front of her as she scurries to and fro, shouting some directives towards some of the other library workers and trying to keep order as best she can. It's a very busy day at the library and she seems to be severely understaffed. This woman is running around trying her best to pick up all of the lost scrolls and other tomes that have been dropped or discarded and file them away in the appropriate places. Now, I believe one of our players actually is a cloistered scholar. Is that correct? We have, I believe, Angela's character. <laughs> Hello, Angela. We Hello. see a we see a young owlin woman, and I assume you're a female character. I can you can obviously be whichever gender you like. And the librarian woman is rushing up to you and shouting some orders. <laughs> this is the person you know as Impatia, the librarian. She is the head facilitator of the Grand Library of Sor Phoebe. And as you well know, as the cloistered scholar of this place, she is rather brusque. Not a, not a rude or a mean woman, but she has a lot on her plate these days. So, Dewey, why don't you take this opportunity to introduce your character for us? Sure thing. Dewey is a cloistered scholar, as you know. He is on the the small and the stout side. He likes to keep to himself and keep busy with his work and stay out of the way of all the other library workers. He prides himself on his work ethic, but he spends his time just doing his work and doing his best to stay out of the way of all the other busy people working in the library. Dewey, you're in my way. You're always getting in my way, Dewey, shouts Impatient the Librarian to you. <laughs> Would you move your little feathers out of my way so I can get these scrolls and take these to aisle 17 and take these to aisle 15, if you would, please. Now, Dewey, you know Impatient fairly well. You've been working. Well, how long have you been working at this, at this library? I was actually found in the library as a, an egg. I was hatched in the nonfiction section between the war and the nature books. <laughs> and I have been raised by the other library workers to do their bidding ever since. So I've been tied to the library ever since I was born. Interesting, interesting. Why don't you go ahead and roll me a history check? Now, audience, this is going to be a learning experience because I believe I picked on Angela, who is one of the players who has never, in fact, played Dungeons & Dragons before. <laughs> so this is going to be a good tutorial section for everybody involved. So a check in D&D is when we attempt to learn or figure out or do something in the game. D&D is an open world experience where we can attempt to do pretty much anything our imaginations let us and we are guided in part by our character sheets, which is probably somewhat invisible because of my background. But our character sheets dictate some of the abilities we have, but we can really do anything that our imagination asks us to do. However, everything is up to chance, and your odds can be improved if you are good at something versus not good at something. So as a cloistered scholar, I would imagine that Dewey is fairly proficient in history and knowledge. Now, I could be wrong about this, but Angela, if you would take a look at your character sheet on the left side, you'll see a list of skills. And among those skills listed in alphabetical order 
One of them is going to be history. And this is a good learning tutorial for all of our players who are somewhat new to the game. If you look on that left-hand section where it says skills, you'll notice that some of the numbers are higher than others. These are called our modifiers. Modifiers are numbers that we add or subtract to our dice roll to give us the, the result that we are trying to achieve. The higher the number, generally speaking, the better off we are. So players, take a moment now to look at your sheets. If you haven't already poured through them, I know you've memorized every single number <laughs> on your sheet. Just for safekeeping, take a look at your skills and your saving throws and get a sense of what skills are better for you, what you have higher numbers in. For the most part, you will see a little black dot next to your skills that have higher numbers. That means you are proficient in them. Proficiency, of course, meaning that you excel at them more than the average person. So when we make a check in Dungeon and Dragons, we roll our d20, which is our 20-sided do dodecahedron die. We add or subtract the modifier next to it. And I have a number in my mind that the players will have to beat. And if that player beats that number, they succeed or they might have greater knowledge. So I'm gonna have Angela make our first roll of the game and roll a history check, rolling her d20 die. And I'm gonna help her along a little bit because she's new. Angela, I've got your sheet right here. It looks like, if I'm not mistaken, you have a plus three in history, which is pretty good. So go ahead and roll. And since you were born in this library and have spent all your time here, I'm gonna give you what's called advantage. Audience, you're also welcome to use the comment section to chime in and with any you know rules that, I, that I'm announcing to help the people reading along at home. If anybody knows what advantage means, you're welcome to throw it into the comment section. But Angela, for your sake, advantage means you have a better chance of success. You get to roll that d20 two times and you get to take the higher number. So let's say you roll a one and then an 18, you get to take that 18. So go ahead and roll me a d20 two times and add your history modifier, which is that plus three there. And tell us okay. what you get. All right, so for my first roll, I have a two. <laughs> And uh, three would be five, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And then right. for my second one, I have a 20. A natural 20? Um, mm-hmm. All right, so this is actually a great learning experience for everybody. A natural 20 audience, I don't know if you can comment in the sections quickly enough, but a natural 20, what do we call that in Dungeons & Dragons? We typically call that a critical hit okay. or a critical. So in, in combat, it's called a critical hit. But outside of combat, we just call it a critical. And a critical is a, yes, exactly. M. Neko in the comment section has explained the difference between advantage and disadvantage. That's very helpful. So a natural 20 is an automatic success and usually comes with an even bit better boon. So Angela has started us off on the right note with a natural 20 on her history check. So Angela, you know everything there is to know about the library, which is great because it means I just get to dump all the exposition on you and you just get to remember it for later. Audience, feel free to take notes if Angela needs help later on. Angela, you were born and raised in this library. Dewey has seen every corner of this place and you are quite familiar with the ins and outs of the working library. You know all of the facts that I stated before. Number one, that it was built about 60 to 70 years ago as a buffer between the warring city-states of Sort and Ephebi, which for the record are spelled T-S-O-R-T -T for Sort, and Ephebi is E-P-H-E-B-E -E -E for Ephebi. And the library has stood the test of time and has fulfilled its function quite well. There has been little to no outward conflict between the two city-states, and the library itself and the surrounding agoraphobia and the hill have been completely peaceful since the library has stood. Now that's not to say that there have not been occasional outbreaks of small acts of violence in the city states proper. Of course, there are always gonna be minor skirmishes between people and between soldiers, but it has been much better recently. You also know that thanks to the opening of the borders between the two city states, foreigners have flooded in from all corners of the land to browse and to learn about this grand new library, which is by far the biggest on the planet. It has compendiums of all facets of knowledge from military history to local history, to mathematics, science, philosophy, 
but really there is something for everybody at this library. And stuck in the middle of it all is poor, poor Impatia the librarian who began her work basically when the library started. She is a, not a very young woman and she, it, and f as far as you're concerned, Dewey, she's bitten off a little bit more than she can chew in this regard. <laughs> she's really, like I said, quite understaffed. And while she's not an unpleasant or mean woman, he is certainly very busy these days. So as we get to know Dewey, our Owlin, who, by the way, I do have an Owl token, which I'll find in a second here. But Dewey, as Impatia gives you these orders, how do you react? Do you respond? Are you taken aback by her brusqueness? Or do you, you know, is this kind of like run of the mill for you? Dewey, I would say, is used to this sort of thing, but he's having a particularly bad day, so he's he's not reacting too well to the sudden outburst, I would say. All right, so audience, let's go back to our slides of all of the different people. Thank you, Dewey. This is our Dewey token, little owl here. We have our other individuals, audience. Who would we like to focus on next? We've got the strangely dress dressed foreigner, the guardsman, the beautiful woman and the kind of crazy old man. So who would we like to see next? Okay, I saw guardsman first. Oh, and then crazy old man. Okay, crazy old man. We got a couple for crazy old man. All right. We see in the square this togood man in sandals with a glassy-eyed expression. Now, when we see him close up, we notice that his eyes have a gray tint behind them. And it doesn't look like he is looking in any direction in particular as he stands upon his soapbox and spouts some words, which we will hear through the ears of our next character. As we see a rather large tiefling, a tiefling for the uninitiated is essentially a half devil. So Gramata Spinebreaker, Gramata, why don't you describe and tell us who your character is and tell us, you know, any background information you would like and what they look like, what their mannerisms are. Hi, everybody. I am playing Gramata Spinebreaker, a tiefling, which means sort of half demon from the Nine Hells, barbarian. So she was sort of found by the barbarians, doesn't know much about her tiefling upbringing, but wanted to learn more. And so she actually left her barbarian tribe to start studying, which is not something that the tribe was very happy about. Mm. They don't really like that whole studying thing, but she did it anyway. And uh, she became a librarian so that she could learn as much as she possibly could. And, cool. and that's Gramata. All right, so Gramata, you are also a librarian at this facility. You're taking some time outside of the library for a change uh, to get some fresh air out in the agoraphobia. And you stumble upon one of many, what we would think of as philosophers, on the Ephebian side of the library. As I mentioned before, the Sordian side is where most of the military people are whereas the Ephebian side is where most of the philosophers are. So you're currently hanging out on the Ephebian side. And you gather around this man's soapbox, and he is shouting vitriol against the library, <laughs> saying things like, This knowledge is the path to the devil! This library should never have been constructed, says I, blind didactylus the 23rd. It is the path to evil! The knowledge here is made by men. The only true truth is that told by the god, Blind Io. He is the Thunderer and the only one that we should be listening to, not these false prophets and their tomes and scrolls. You see this old man. Now, you know, with your background, I don't know, do you agree with him? Do you, you know, you, he's got a sizable audience. Some of them are throwing things at him. He seems to be spilling a lot of his wine goblet on his robe, which is why it's got that kind of maroon color to it. And he's sloshing around and doesn't seem to really mind the fruit being thrown at him. He seems to be rather filthy, actually. It's hard to tell if this is a philosopher or just a drunk, old, rambling homeless man. But, you know, there is some truth in some ways to what he's saying. So how do you react to the situation, Gramata? So Gramata stands up slowly to her full height, which is about 6'3", and kind of stares this old man down, and then her loud voice yells, Old man! 
Where yeah. have you heard these things before? Yeah. I want citations. Ah, interesting. Why don't you roll a either a persuasion or an intimidation check? You're, again, this is another check that we can do in D and D. Persuasion is if you're trying to play nice cop. Intimidation is if we're trying to be a little bit more forceful in our demeanor. So, Grimada, I will leave it up to you. I, I have the same modifier for both, so I'm going to go for intimidation. All right. I did not do well. It's a five total. <laughs> All right. I don't. I'm not in terribly intimidated by you, despite your tall stature and your devilish demeanor, Miss. I did not give you my name. I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm going to give you my name. But not being intimidated by me was your first mistake. So you say. Before this library was built, I was a young man, and this hill, the grand on top of this, was the beacon of my god, Blind Io, the Thunderer. And he was not happy that this structure was built upon his hill, nor was he happy that these interlopers from afar, foreign lands have come in and disturbed his realm. He is angry and wrathful, and you, Miss Unnamed Tiefling, will be one of the first to suffer his fiery wrath. Mark my words. Can I do a check on this blind Io? Yes, you can. That would be a religion check. Players and commenters in this comment section, you can also tell our heroes who might need some assistance if you think they should do a check. So players, just like Karina did just now, you can call for a check against me. So you can say, hey, I'd like to roll to learn about this thing that you just told me, or I'd like to roll to yell at, you know, to intimidate this person. So Karina is rolling a religion check to see what she knows about this god, Blind Io. And what did you get? Maybe a little better than a five? 19. 19, all right, there we go. With a 19, you know that Blind Io is essentially the Zeus of this world. He is known as the Thunderer. And he, like this gentleman who's identified himself as Blind Didactylus the 23rd, is blind. Blind Didactylus, you can see, is not making eye contact with you. He's sort of staring where your voice is coming from. So it's pretty apparent to you that he does not have his vision. <clears throat> the same is true of Blind Io, the god of the Thunderer, who was it was said was blinded many millennia ago in a battle with some lesser gods. But through that battle, he reigned victorious and is now the king of the pantheon of the Sort and Ephebian gods. One thing that the Sortians and Ephebians do agree on is their pantheon. They do have the same gods that they worship, those that do worship, of course. Many uh, on top of in the library, perhaps such as yourself, are more secular based and don't believe in any gods. But those who do revere Io with a great fear and a great respect, knowing that at any moment he can launch down thunderbolts from the sky and rain terror upon those who disrespect him. It is said that he does not have sight, but rather he has thousands of ravens. Every raven in the world is said to act as his eyes, meaning they literally, he literally can see through them. So he is, in a sense, omnipotent. Anywhere that you see a raven, you can be quite sure that Blind Io is keeping a watchful eye out over you. So then does this mean what he says is true, that where the library is, there used to be a temple to Blind Io? There used to be a temple. Now, no one has seen Blind Io. It's been said in millennia past that he has taken the form of humans and procreated with mankind. This is not necessarily founded in fact, but if you believe it, then it's true. There was, but what he's saying is true as far as the belief system goes. There was a temple to Io up here originally built by, and it was believed that he lived up here. It was then raised to the ground about a century ago, century ago and replaced with the library as a way to, again, keep the peace. Part of what you say is true, blind man, but your ravens need to do a little bit more digging. If you would like mm. to erect a new temple, we can talk. I will take no advice from a, a heretic such as yourself. Go, go from my lack of sight. <laughs> and he kind of like ushers you away. This production of Librarians and Dragons 
was brought to you by the East Brunswick, New Brunswick, Piscataway, and South Brunswick Public Libraries. Our dungeon master was Adam Samter of Tabletop Now. Enjoy other adventures on the EBPL Podcast Network by visiting ebpl.org backslash podcast. <laughs>